<laughs> so uh, that's not true, uh, but it, there's there, there's just a lot. Um, but welcome, welcome to Messy Conversations. Uh, welcome to uh, Black History Month. Um, real quickly, a couple of announcements. Um, Next, uh, ne next week's Messy Conversation, uh, we're going to honor and celebrate a little bit uh, Black Love Day, February 13th. Um, and uh, Rosa and Asa will be leading us through an interactive uh, project uh, called uh, the Six Words Project, um, which I'm super excited about. It's going to be a lot, of, a lot of fun and I think hopefully uh, really insightful as well. Um, so we're very grateful to Rosa and Asa for, for doing that. The, the following Monday is going to be President's Day, um, where you can celebrate your favorite president. Um, we won't be having a messy conversation on uh, President's Day. That's how we're celebrating uh, our favorite president. <laughs> no, no messy conversation. And then our final messy conversation of the winter quarter as hard as that is to believe, it's true, but it, uh, Anna will return with a couple of conversationalists to talk about the history of the Black community in Santa Barbara. And we were super lucky to get Anna uh, because she's coming off the wild success of last week's uh, messy conversation on uh, anti-racist pedagogy. And we didn't know if we'd be able to get her or not, but she's graciously making time uh, to return for our final messy conversation of this winter quarter. Um, as always, uh, it's helpful if you remain muted uh, until asked to join the conversation. It helps to, to keep the background noise uh, down and, and uh, helps us who need to, uh, to concentrate a little bit. Um, but we want you as part of the conversation. Uh, and so we encourage you, uh, we, 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 we implore you uh, to, to put comments and questions and ideas and resources and anything that occurs to you that um, uh, fits with our conversation in the chat. And we will get to you uh, as soon as we can. Um, and with that, I think we, we want to start our Messy Conversations book club, uh, where we are looking at Sadia Hartman's absolutely extraordinary book. Uh, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments. The more time I spend with this book, the more in love I am with this book. I was just saying, I honestly think I could use it as the primary uh, text for almost every class I teach. Uh, it's that, that good. Uh, Asa, did you want to start with your reading? Yeah, th thanks, David. Um, I won't gush about the book too much so that we have time to just get into it, but I'm going to start with the, the opening of book one and um, share my screen, which has some images from uh, the book as well. The Terrible Beauty of the Slum. You can find her in the group of beautiful thugs and two fast girls congregating on the corner and humming the latest rag or lingering in front of Wanamaker's and gazing lustfully at a pair of fine shoes displayed like jewels behind the glass plate glass window. Watch her in the alley passing a pitcher of beer back and forth with her friends. Brash and lovely in a cut rate dress and silk ribbon. Look in awe as she hangs halfway out of a tenement window, taking in the drama of the block and defying gravity's downward pull. Step onto any of the paths that cross the sprawling city and you'll encounter her as she roams. Outsiders call the streets and alleys that comprise her world the slum. For her, it is just the place where she stays. You'd never happen onto her block unless you lived there too or had lost your way or out on an evening lark seeking the pleasures yielded by the other half. The voyeurs on their slumming expeditions feed on the lifeblood of the ghetto, long for it and loathe it. The social scientists 
and the reformers are no better with their cameras and their surveys, staring intently at all the strange specimens. Her ward of the city is a labyrinth of foul alleys and gloomy courts. It is Africa town, the Negro quarter, the native zone. The Italians and Jews engulfed by proximity disappear. It is a world concealed behind the facade of the ordered metropolis, the not yet dilapidated buildings and decent homes that face the street hide the alley tenement where she lives. Entering the narrow passageway into the alley, one crosses the threshold into a raucous disorderly world, a place defined by tumult, vulgar collectivism and anarchy. It is a human sewer populated by the worst elements. It is a realm of excess and fabulousness. It is a wretched environment. It is the plantation extended into the city. It is a social laboratory. The ghetto is a, place, is a space of encounter. The sons and daughters of the rich come in search of meaning, vitality, and pleasure. The reformers and sociologists come in search of the truly disadvantaged, failing to see her and her friends as thinkers or planners or to notice the beautiful experiments crafted by poor black girls. Thank you, uh, Asa. Also a, a quick uh, public acknowledgement. Uh, thank you to Asa for, for stepping in. Originally, Clarence and I were gonna do this uh, together and he's not been feeling all that well. So Asa stepped in. Um, I'm, I'm also gonna do a quick reading and then we'll get into the conversation. Uh, this is from uh, a chapter called Wayward, a short entry on the possible. And I think it really gives a great sense of, of, of what this book is about. Wayward, related to the family of words, errant, fugitive, recalcitrant, anarchic, willful, reckless, troublesome, riotous, tumultuous, rebellious, and wild. To be deeply aware of the gulf between where you stayed and how you might live. Waywardness, the avid longing for a world not ruled by master, man, or the police. In search of a place better than here, a social poesis that sustains the dispossessed, wayward, the unregulated movement of drifting and wandering, sojourns without a fixed destination, ambulatory possibilities. Inter, interminable migrations, interminable, excuse me, migrations, rush and flight, black locomotion, the everyday struggle to live free, not the master's tools, but the paradox of cramped creation, the entanglement of escape and confinement, flight and captivity, wayward, to wander, to be unmoored, adrift, rambling, roving, cruising, strolling, and seeking, to claim the right to opacity, to strike, to riot, to refuse, to love what is not loved, to be lost to the world, the otherwise, the insurgent ground that enables new possibilities, at new vocabularies. It is the lived experience of enclosure and segregation, assembling and huddling together. It's the directionless search for a free territory. It's a queer resource of Black survival. It's a beautiful experiment in how to live. So thank you for your patience letting us read to you for a second. And we wanted to start, I wanted to ask Asa, so what, what draws you to this book? I know you love this book as well. What, what draws you to Hartman's work in this book? Well, I encountered this book initially through um, my background in, in archives and in library school, and specifically in the way that she approaches archives and um, the kind of methodology that she's developed, um, which we can we'll get into in more detail later, I'm sure. But, um, you know, in the field of archival studies, there's a lot of uh, work on the 
imagination, the role of the imagination and the silence of the archive. So things that are not recorded, not collected, deemed to be uh, unimportant during their time. So things that end up going to a landfill or um, just get erased or, you know, written over. And um, the ability to imagine what those records could have been in given that they don't exist. And I think in this book, Hartman is able to uh, create almost a, a new type of genre. Uh, I know it, it, it won a American uh, Book Critics Award and in, they put it in the category of uh, criticism, which is interesting uh, rather than history or um, fiction even, some people have said. Um, so there's definitely, a, uh, there was something about the way she approaches history and the, the historical record that I found just really um, fresh and new and exciting. And um, that's kind of just the surface. So then you actually get into the content of it. And of course there's uh, her like political project and, and um, you know, the actual content of what she's doing with that imaginary archive. Um, so that that was my inroad to it. And I also had the pleasure of already reading it with you a bit in sections in um, a class that I audited when I first joined Antioch, uh, the Living Endings class. So um, I wanted to pose that to you as well. How did you end up um, getting interested in this work and bring it into that course in particular? Yeah, uh, well, thank you for all that. And we will uh, definitely dig in on the archive and the violence of the archive and her methodology. Um, as Asa mentioned, I teach a course. It's probably the most important course to me personally that I teach. It's uh, on ecological existentialism, how to live endings. And it's a course that looks at the dance, the tango, if you will, between existential endings, whether that's, you know, death or, or, or the in, end of a relationship or someone else's death or, you know, a, a way of being in the world or, or your, your career or whatever it is, those existential endings, and then also looking at ecological endings. Um, and, and what happens when those two are in a tango together? How, do, how can they inform one another? What is there to, 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 to glean um, from that encounter? Uh, really important course to me for all kinds of reasons. And, and so when I, when I was drawn to Hartman's book, first because of the title, you know, oh, wait, wayward. Well, that's, that's got me all over it. Wayward, I'll take that. And, and then, you know, lives that are beautiful experiments. And so a lot of what we're doing in the course is trying to imagine, well, how do we live through these endings? You know, the, the, the endings of a particular kind of relationship with the earth. How do we live through that? How, how, how do we go, how do we live through the existential endings? And so here was a book that, um, that, that explored that from a perspective that I had never considered, frankly, or been privy to. Uh, and it reminded me a great deal of another fantastic book called The, the, the Many-Headed Hydra, Sailors, Slaves, Commoners, and the Hidden History of the Revolutionary Atlantic by Linebaugh and, and, and Redeker. And they're, they're doing a, a project where they're, they're looking at all these common challenges to capitalism that have been erased from history. And so, you know, and, and so it's a celebration of pirates and, and, and slaves uh, or the enslaved and commoners and, and all of this. And so that always appealed to me, but I had never, had this perspective of uh, young African American women who have moved from the South uh, po post slavery uh, into Philadelphia and New York and encountered extraordinary economic 
uh, uh, oppression and yet carved out wayward lives, these beautiful experiments in how to be as a form of resistance. So that's, that's what resonated so, so deeply for me. Um, do, do you want to start, Asa, by talking about the, the methodology? Should we get into critical fabulation for a bit? I think, I think that's a good place to start, um, kind of give the framing for what the whole project, how, how she approached the whole project. And um, there, there is a essay that she wrote prior to this book that where she kind of coins the term and really gives a further definition of what she means by critical fabulation, which is the what she's named this kind of practice of um, interweaving narrative and a kind of internal um, explanation of, of history from a, a kind of intimate point of view of people's lives um, using historical research and, and documents. I mean, she did a ton of archival research for this book. There's, um, you know, just an incredible amount of, um, you know, deep dives into uh, penal records, into um, government records, tracing the lives of these women and girls who otherwise are kind of lost to history. Um, there's a, a short quote from that article, um, that, which is titled Venus in Two Acts. And it's I've uh, linked it in the lib guide. So uh, we have access to it through the library as well if you want to read it. Um, but the quote I want to read she writes, um, is it possible to exceed or negotiate the constitutive limits of the archive by advancing a series of speculative arguments and exploiting the capacities of the subjunctive, a grammatical mood that expresses doubts, wishes, and possibilities in fashioning a narrative, which is based upon archival research. And by that, I mean critical reading of the archive that mimes the figurative dimensions of history, I intended both to tell an impossible story and to amplify the impossibility of its telling. That's one sentence. She, <laughs> she, she writes some sentences, you know. Um, it's but, so different from, from the book. Yeah, this is her, you know, that academic journal article uh, writing. But um, I, I love this idea of telling an impossible story and in doing that, amplifying the impossibility of its telling. So it's a way of pointing to what is not possible to do by imagining it. Um, so trying to get into the motivations, the desires, the inner life of these women and girls and historical figures um and it, by doing that it kind of points to the fact that we have no way of doing that that um because these women were considered wayward or um outside of the social norms and kind of accepted society uh it wasn't deemed valuable to understand their thinking or or motivations. It was just seen as delinquent or something to be um, squashed, you know, and, and done away with through prison, through um, policing and surveillance. So that was kind of a, a long-winded answer, but um, I'm wondering your thoughts if you wanted to speak to that critical fabulation idea. Yeah, no, I, I would love to. And I, and I also think I may have a follow-up question for you. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I, I, I love it. I mean, partly it, one reason I love it is that it, it, it resonates with Donna Haraway's uh, speculative fabulation. Um, and and a court, but 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 what's interesting is the fabulations are are looking in different directions, 
right? So Haraway is looking at the future, right? Speculative fabulation about possibilities in the future. And Hartman is looking at critical fabulation and looking at the, the archival record of the past. But still, you know, that that certainly caught my attention. And the other thing that caught my attention is the the the, the deep connection with uh, critical race theory. And, um, and and Hartman is clearly a practitioner of critical race theory, um, which we usually think of, you know, in, in I think in a relatively narrow sense of uh, uh, the law, right? And 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 as the response to the whole civil rights approach to the law, which is, well, let us in. Right, let us in and, and count us as equals. Let us play the let us play along as equals. And critical race theory coming along and saying, yeah, and the whole project of the law is problematic. It, it it it's it's built on racist assumptions. And so to begin to investigate that, and one of the people that uh, who, who whose work has been important to. Uh, to, to, to me over time, uh, I'm forgetting your first name right now, oh, Mari, M Mari Matsuda, um, who works out of uh, Hawaii, and she's just amazing, like just rocks my world in so many ways. Um, but she, uh, she does a lot of work with um, the importance of storytelling and the importance of counter narrative. And that that's that within the context of critical race theory. So so you know how do how do you how do we tell these stories? How do we construct these counter narratives? And and it's clear to me this is exactly what Hartman is doing with uh, critical fabulation. She's constructing counter narratives and putting uh, flesh and bone or excuse me, flesh and, and, and muscle and, and vitality on the bones of the archive so that these women aren't just anonymous or aren't just names written in a police ledger, uh, but they come alive and uh, with all of their complex subjectivity. Uh, and, and yeah, it's just, I, I could go on and on and on about how uh, important that is uh, for, for me. Um, if I may, though, a quick, quick follow up on you. <laughs> Wait. Yeah, very quick. But just, you know, I think in Venus and Two Acts, I, I'm pretty sure she uses the, the, the phrase, the, the violence of the archive. And, yeah. um, and I just wonder, as an archivist uh, practitioner, <laughs> <laughs> um, how does that hit you? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a archival violence, or there's a violence in the archive in many levels. There's, we can think like historically about cases in which the kind of documentation of people and the recording of, um, you know, statistics about groups of people was an actual tool of genocide of violence of um kind of real world um persecution there's many examples of that um there are also ways in which uh there's a term um like a I'm forgetting the exact term but a, a erasure identitive erasure that comes from certain archival practices where um, by simply not including certain people or certain stories, uh, you have a way of diminishing the impact of, of those groups or um, their historical import. There, there's also a violence to that, of course. The quote I actually did pull that as well. She where she says, "I want to do more than account the violence that deposited these traces in the archive." So in that case, you can think of, you know, the arrests themselves are violent acts. There's in the section on um, vagrancy laws, which I think that was really illustrative to me about, you know, the links with critical race theory, where essentially these laws were 
developed after the fact as a way of being able to surveil and uh, interrupt the way these people were living their lives, you know, that gave police the ability to just bust into any room that they wanted to uh, if it was suspected there were vagrants living there and uh, prostitution. So uh, there's that actual violent act of the only reason we have certain images like mugshot photos or, you know, these letters um, is because of the violence of incarceration and, and arrest from the state. So there's a clear link there with between the, vi the archive and the violent acts that were needed in order to gather the documents in the archive. Um, so I think there's been also a real move to kind of get away from that and have uh, community-based archives or groups of people coming together to kind of collectively decide this is what, these are the records we think are important to tell our story rather than relying on um, the state or major institutions to kind of um, play that role. And I think um, Harvin very clearly like fits into that tradition as well. We, we are so lucky to have you as our undergraduate studies librarian. Uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, hey, so uh, let's, let's talk uh, some about the wayward um, and, and I'll kick off and hand it off to you if that's acceptable. Please. Um, so so I, I, I opened by reading a, a, a almost the entire chapter, actually. It's only a page long chapter on uh, on the wayward, a short, uh, something like a short description of the possible or, or, or something like that. And just all the language in there about, you know, the wayward and the otherwise and the, uh, the, the desire for opacity um, and uh, all of this stuff just, oh man, just runs through my body in, in incredible ways. Um, and so I'm, I think about the wayward in a lot of ways, but I want to think about them in two ways with, with all y'all for a minute. Um, and uh, I'll start with um, one of the ways that I work with this in the course that I teach, which is um, through the lens of illegibility. Um, and there's a bunch of scholarship, um, mostly based on the work of a, a guy named Scott uh, on um, on legibility and illegibility and the way in which the state moved towards legibility of its citizens, being able to read its citizens as a way of controlling its citizens. And then all these resistance movements, uh, which were rooted in illegibility, well, you know, being, you know, having a, an opacity um, so that you could not be read. Um, and of course, all of that has incredible implications for today with the internet and social media and all of that sort of stuff and how legible we all are and, and, and continually making ourselves just handing up all of our legibility. But, um, but, but I, love, I, I love this idea. It's, it's very Foucauldian idea in, in, in a way um, of you know, the, 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 that being able to read people is a way of controlling people. And that in the lives of these young women, part of what they were doing was uh, a fuck you to being read and living these wayward lives. And, you know, I don't need the state to justify my relationship. I don't need the state to justify my, 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 my relationship with my children. I don't need, you know, or, or what I'm doing with my time or why I'm on the streets at 1030 at night alone, or I don't know, no, 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 no. And this constant, constant kind of pushback against legibility. And then ironically, what do we have? We just have these little scraps of paper of an arrest record or a, a sentence handed down by a court 
or uh, an, a sanitarium that they somebody had been sent to, and and just little and that's all the state had. But the, the, it was at a really important, we're talking early 20th century, really important time for the state to begin to um, make us as citizens as legible as they possibly could, uh, to be able to read us in order to uh, control us. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to touch on. But the other thing, and, and, and I want to say this, and I know you have a, a, a strong interest in this, ASIS, so I'll, I'll hand it off to you. but. A, a lot of the, the, the waywardness of these young women, uh, which was met by social reformers and sociologists uh, like Paul Dunbar and W.E.B. Uh, du Bois and seen as the, the Negro problem, right? The, 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 these were wayward women. They were, didn't have good morals. They were not controllable. They were, oh my God, the whole thing's gonna fall apart. But what, what, what Hartman does with it is say, oh, no, 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 no. This is, this is an anarchic revolution. This is before uh, what we think of as the, you know, certainly the Harlem Renaissance. This is before F. Scott Fitzgerald. This is before all of that. And these young African-American women are on the forefronts of she calls it a, a, a revolution of intimacy. Um, and it's so beautiful. And, 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 and she glorifies uh, their love for the fabulous and for beauty and for the, you know, those shoes that they can't really afford, but they get them, right? And, and, and to strut their stuff in the dance halls and all, it's just so vibrant and sensual and erotic. And, and I love that she gets the importance of that in our, not only in our everyday lives, but in the lives of political resistance. Um, and in trying to craft new ways of being and in, in trying to craft living otherwise. And all of that makes me think uh, of this quotation from Audre Lorde, uh, if you don't mind, 1978 uh, from her extraordinary piece on the uses of the erotic. Uh, and if you're familiar with the book, um, just you know, think about the book as I'm reading uh, Lord to you for a second. Uh, there are many kinds of power used and unused, acknowledged or otherwise. The erotic is a resource within each of us that lies in a deeply female and spiritual plane, rooted in the power of our own unexpressed or unrecognized feeling. In order to perpetuate itself, every oppression must corrupt or distort those various sources of power within the culture of the oppressed that can provide any energy for change. For women, this has meant the suppression of the erotic, and it has con, con, it, and as a considered source of power and information within our lives. And, and I, I know that Lord is doing something a little bit different with the erotic than Hartman is, but the, the language just resonates. Uh, and, and, I, and I think about that in social justice work, for instance, which gets all too damn serious and often loses touch with the body, with the erotic, with laughter, with, with play. Um, and, and here's an, this uh, critical fabulation that, that, that unearths all of that and, and brings it up to us and invites us to dance with it. And I know that this is super uh, Im important to you as well, Asis. I'll shut up and let you say something. <laughs> oh, there's, yeah, there's so many directions to go. And I definitely do want to, you know, open it up so it's not all just two white guys talking about uh, Black women the whole time. But um, I did like, uh, there was a, um, when you when you offered that Audre Lorde quote, um, I went back and looked at some of the the sections that we um, 
and, and Clarence actually selected. And there's um, there's definitely the a kind of tapping into the desire and eroticism that uh, awakens something for for Hartman at least. Um, she sees this as a kind of uh, something new on the on the horizon after um, you know this is kind of the first generation coming up to the urban centers uh, from previous plantation living and this uh, so I'll, there's a section in the, it's on page 62 on, in the section uh, an intimate history of slavery and freedom uh, where she she writes uh, to yield to be undone and dispossessed by the force of her desire and for no other reason than that she wanted to made Maddie feel vital untethered and this freedom was sensual and palpable like the taste of Herman Hawkins in her mouth a force so arresting it could stop her in her tracks make her ache in anticipation of what could happen. The sweetness of bodies was stoked by self-forgetting. In that room, she tried to slip away, elude the hold of the plantation and the police, and pry open time into an endless stretch of possibility. So I think there's something in there that's really core to kind of what Harman's doing of like tapping into this um, moment of endless possibility that that opens up at this point in history before it can be kind of um, uh, so to your first point before it becomes legible to the power structures and before they can say oh we better make some laws that don't let young women do this <laughs> because we don't want people living that way you know and I think one thing I really took away from this in terms of like a political messaging that we could maybe apply um, is that there was a, a real push to kind of see a reform as possible that if, if we can integrate this energy into the current structure, then, you know, we can all, you know, rise, all the boats will rise and, you know, we can kind of, uh, get on to having a country <laughs> a single nation or something and i think for hartman it's to say like you actually couldn't reform this into the system it was um radically different and kind of um like anarchic and um it required a kind of complete rethinking of um how society was structured if if you were going to allow for this kind of life to be lived at that time you know free young black women doing what they want to do because they want to do it it's like something that's never been allowed you know um and on that i don't want to take up too much more time and uh i did i haven't even been able to keep up with the chat so I'll, i don't know if there's i um, i'm looking yeah. Thank, thank you guys. I'm, I'm looking at the chat and there's a, like a, a range of comments. Thank you guys. Uh, and there's uh, this topic of, uh, of uh, uh, Sarah, Sarah Beth, I don't know, you want to bring up this, this idea of the disparities between the relationship of the systems and the collusion of medicine and psychiatry, like this, this that, that you brought up, because we're talking about how, how the, the systems are against anything that is subversive. <laughs> they try to just systematize and co-opt it. And then this is one way that you pointed out. I don't want to elaborate on that and we can move into the into the vagrancy loss. That is a commentary. Thanks, Rosa. Um, I just uh, saw that photograph that you showed, um, um, Esa and it had the therapist or the, the psychiatrist or the medical practitioner's name on it with, um, uh, can you pull that up again? And it just made, it just reminded me of that, um, that earlier talk we had on healthcare disparities and, and how these fields collude and have been colluding. And uh, what really I couldn't um, stop tripping on throughout the book was what she said about stigma is not an attribute. 
it is a relationship. And that feels so powerful in so many ways to talking about these um, white systems and the problems of, of all of those um, messages, including what I imagine to be a, a tie to religion as well with the moral dilemma of, of, of sex work and, um, and those experiences that, that she's describing. Is it on this one? You're mute, Sarabeth. Sorry about that. Yeah. So it was a council. It said council. So this is the attorney. Mm -hmm. And um, I just thought of this this term being used in such a strange way, council, as um, a tie to these other places where historically there was so much collusion between these departments. And when somebody would refuse to uh, follow the order, so to speak, there were supporting um, practitioners who would force um, other realities. And it's still the case. I actually just noticed that wayward minor right it's right there on the actual court form uh -huh. yeah thank you sarah beth uh the uh, example of the of the institutionalization of of, uh, of abuse right and then what happened with the the vagrancy at laws uh, clarence and jacqueline were bringing up this idea of the of how the vagrancy laws gave way to more uh, systemic, uh, insidious systems are the ones that we see today. You can trace them back, thanks to the archival impetus that we can see here, you can trace back all this uh, to a current uh, complex, prison complex and free labor stuff. Clarence, do you want to comment anything? Well, what I'd really like to say is, um, first of all, the book, is almost poetic, even though, you know, the reality, as Asa pointed out, is largely um, steeped in archival um, connectedness, um, what is as opposed to what could be. And then, of course, it, it begs for the future in the way that she beautifully writes um, the stories. But what I look at is, um, as pointed out by Asa earlier, most of these women were first generation to leave with the great migration. They were like the first of post-slavery to land in Philadelphia, New York, and all of those urban areas. And the beauty is they could reinvent themselves despite all of the trauma they may be carrying, despite you know, all of the harm and the hurt, they could appear in this new urban setting, even though they're they're in these tenement houses. They could become a sex worker if they wanted to. They could become, you know, a, a Bible thumper. They could become a washerwoman. They could become a nightclub um, singer. It really depended on them. And because they were Black women, seen or unseen, but mainly invisible, they had the power, this power we keep talking about, this power they could possess, you know, people who did see them and they could also reinvent themselves to the point that they could actually be anything and anyone they wanted to be. And that power is what brought them into these beautiful experiments because they could keep going from one thing to the next if they wanted to, or they could you know, accept the environmental conditions of their reality and just remain you know, docile but they have the power. And that's what I love about this. But yeah, the vagrancy law was, was brought about to support the 13th Amendment. It was one of the black codes and therefore this is a way that they could systematically control black people, even in the urban settings that they were migrating to. This is a way that they could be tossed into prison, tossed into jail 
and gotten uh, free labor, which is another form, of course, of slavery. So it was simply to disrupt the freedom. Mm -hmm. I could, I, I love that, Clarence. Thanks. And I, I wanted to just as you were speaking on that, I pulled, I was looking at the section on vagrancy and uh, really aligns with what you were saying. She writes that vagrancy was a status, not a crime. It was not doing, withholding, non-participation, the refusal to be settled or bound by contract to employer or husband. And that common law defined the vagrant as, quote, someone who wandered about without visible means of support. So basically just, as you're saying, like someone who is inventing themselves and is uh, unreadable to <laughs> the law that's saying, you know, you, you can't do that. You have to uh, have a, we have to be able to know what you are. Um, so yeah, that, I, I was unaware of that whole history and the, the links going back all the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> incredible. <laughs> it makes Free. Yeah, sorry, I'm a little bit sort of back to the sort of some of the comments at the beginning about just the power of story. And I, mean, I think we all know this. I mean, story has been around, you know, well before people were writing books and and stories is such at the heart of learning and of um, engagement and healing and so many things. But um, the whole sort of power of narrative to be oppressive, but if claimed and we tell our own stories and rewrite kind of these histories. So I just I just love this book as well. And I've only been able to so far read the four chapters, but I, it also strikes me as a really elegant example, both at the methodological level um, of the power of rewriting narratives. Um, so I could, I could also, I don't know in every class I teach, but I can see it being a really powerful um, example of that. So I'm very happy to have it. Yeah. So thank you for whoever came up with, I guess it was David and Clarence and, and Asa for bringing it to us and framing this. Another thing that I was thinking about the relationship between um, between the um, the vagrancy and what she's talking about was the beginning, the first piece that we read, um, which were just about the erasure of history. That when you're going somewhere else, all of those things get lost or are now blocked or are missing or are not talked about. And um, we carry them with, I think, uh, like luggage and talk about it like baggage, but it's so important to um, these pieces of history. Thank you, Sarah Bell. Uh, you're reminding me of something that I want to share with you guys, this interse intersectionality between the concept of waywardness and the wording of that and the all the meanings of it with other uh, other forms of resistance in, in other groups, uh, oppressed groups. For example, I'm thinking about the Pantla in the in the Latinx community that, that has this liminal element that, that is so wonderful from the wayward concept. Uh, as a possibility that is in the making and is not quite has a defined identity. And in the Asian ancient community, there is this concept that I have just in class, I'm gonna put it in the chat, the wabi-sabi, and I'm not talking about sushi, the wabi-sabi, that is the concept of appreciation for the what, what is incomplete, chipped or broken, a little bit like a, this not quite what is expected, or the, it's anti-perfectionist. And it's a beautiful concept that reminds me also of, of the waywardness. So I'm just, just em, em, embracing these elements of, of how this same call for uh, justice or the attention to something that is unconventional and that is uh, resisting and that is subversive can, can be named 
and can be investigated and can be archived and can be brought up to the table, right? Yeah, I want to riff on that for a second. First, I want to thank everybody who's uh, making contributions to this conversation and all the amazing points that people are bringing. Um, one of the chapters, one of the four chapters we recommended, it was uh, one that Clarence suggested, uh, was tell, tells the story of Gladys Bentley, uh, Mist of Beauty. And it, 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 it brings what you're talking about, uh, Rosa, into um, what today we would probably call queerness and, and uh, amazing story of this person carving out uh, a, a life at the beginning of the 20th century in powerful ways, uh, a life of the otherwise in powerful ways, um, and, and another wayward person, in, this time in terms of gen gender and sexuality. Um, as, as well as race, and so speaks to that intersectionality that, that you're raising. Um, one of the things I, I yes, I, I, I've asked if I could reserve the last five minutes, but um, uh, but one of the, one of the things that we didn't get to is her idea of the chorus, which is kind of part of what I want to do in those last five minutes. Um, this, I don't even know how to start talking about uh, what she does there. But the second chapter of the book is called A Minor Figure. And it, it has uh, a, a photo of uh, a young, very young uh, woman um, who's anonymous and naked. Um, and we don't know you know, we don't know her name, we don't know anything about her. And Hartman uses that to set up the work of the entire book and says, I'm gonna find a path to her. I'm gonna find a path to her. So how, how does she do that? Through this idea of the chorus um, and that, that there's, we're all part of this larger chorus, or so in, in the case of Hartman's book, so many African-American women were a part of this chorus. So how do we find our way to her? Well, we tell all the stories we possibly can. We hear the chorus of which she is a part. And, um, and, I, I just, and, and that's what the whole book is. The whole book is Hartman telling what she can about other members of the chorus as a way of bringing voice to this nameless young woman that she starts the, the book with. And so this idea of the chorus is just resonating and resonating with me, won't, won't let me go. And with your indulgence, uh, I would like to read you from the, the very closing of the book, uh, which is a chapter, the chorus opens the way. Uh, and I'll read you some of this. And, and then um, again, with your indulgence, I'd like to show you uh, a, a two minute video at the very, very end of our time together. Um, so this is from the, the last chapter, the chorus opens the way. The story exceeds the words, the verses, all the things secreted harbored deep inside are felt and exclaimed, it is all so terrible and so beautiful. The weight of all that has happened is palpable. The immensity of the hurt and betrayal articulated in the rhythm of the line, conveyed in the length of breath. Living is not to be taken for granted. If you're able to bear the burden of what they have to bring, then there is a place for you inside the circle. And what you have suffered is part of this inventory. The war, theft, rout, rape, and plunder are lodged in every line. If you dare to listen and watch or shout, speak, tell it now, or clap your hands, then you're in it. And there's no escape. 
Now it is impossible to turn your back and carry on like the world is the same. The chorus makes a plan. They draft a blueprint, move, escape, rush to the city, quit the job and run away from everything hell bent on sucking all the life out of them. A moment of reprieve. Then trapped somewhere else in a different city, a new place, a stranger's house, the boss's bedroom. No one else imagines anything better. So it is left to the chorus to envision things otherwise. As exhausted as they are, they don't relent. They try to make a way out of no way to not be defeated by defeat. The chorus is the vehicle for another kind of story, not the story of the great man or the tragic hero, but one in which all modalities play a part, where the headless group incites change, where mutual aid provides the resource for collective action. The chorus propels transformation it is an incubator of possibility, an assembly sustaining dreams of the otherwise. And with that, it take me just one second to pull this up. Um, I wanna play you a song, a video. If, if, I, if, I, if I can, I'm almost there. برای توی کوچه رخ سیدن برای ترسیدن به وقت بوسیدن برای خواهرم خواهرت خواهرامون برای تغییر محصا که پوسیدن برای شرمندگی برای بیپولی برای حسرت یک زندگی معمولی برای کودک زبال گرد و آرزوهاش برای این اقتصاد دستوری برای این هوای آلوده برای ولی از رو درخت های فرسوده برای پیروز و احتمال انقرازش برای سگ های بیگناه ممنوعه برای گریه های بیوقفه برای تصویر تکرار این لحظه برای چهره ای که میخنده برای دانش آموزا برای هاینده برای این بهشت اجباری برای نخبه های زندانی برای کودکان افغانی برای این همه برای غیر تکراری برای این همه شعار های تو خالی برای آوار خونه های پوشالی پس از شبای طولانی برای غرص های حساب و بیخوابی برای مرد میهن آبادی برای دختری که آرزو داشت پسر بود برای زن زندگی آزالی برای آزادی Uh, thank you. So that's a uh, Iran, obviously. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, that's Iran, and uh, this song it brings me to tears every time. And all I want to say, not to co-opt uh, one another's histories and experience, but the desire of the chorus. 
continues. A hundred years later, So thank you for being part of uh, today's message conversation. If you'd like to stick around and talk some more, please do. If you got to go, we'll see you next week. But thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to thank you, David, for uh, the conversation and for introducing that. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a powerful way to end it. And the, um, so, hey, so, Asa. Yes. <laughs> one question that didn't come up uh, was uh, why these two white guys? <laughs> I know. I leading thought, this conversation. Well, someone would take it to us at some point, but <laughs> I mean, it I was I would, purposefully. Yeah, Clarence set me up. Besides the fact that Clarence is not feeling well. Well, I keep pushing you guys. I wanted to see us revisit Ask a White Guy. So today we have that. <laughs> I think the, the, uh, the last piece really connects to uh, my thoughts in the beginning. Uh, of how this cultural movement, if you will, uh, or the lifting of the veil of this particular history of Black women, how it parallels I can't hear today. You, uh, how it parallels today. Some parallels today. Even the piece that you, you did, even though it was Iranian women, I think in terms of uh, that particular movement and chapter of history that she researched how it parallels so many things that we see today as it relates to black women. Just kind of join it out there. Um, given the history and violence as we carry that history with us, and that's clearly reflected in this book. Um, because we, black women really had to <laughs> reinvent themselves and started as property to promulgate the system. Clearly there's this measure of history um, of how, I think someone said this everyday struggle to be free, to be who they are. So I think that's conversation in itself, uh, yeah. Yeah, thank thank you, Elaine. And I was saying this when before we started, but um, I think that you know it it would be impossible to read this text and not see um, you know just countless parallels to what's happening now. Um, the the vagrancy law section. There's a whole part about you know these kind of no knock. Uh, they don't didn't call them no knock warrants, but that under the guise of this law, they could just bust into a, a door if they had, you know, given certain uh, suspicions. And uh, I first read this, it, it was right around that, you know, summer of 2020 and there, um, there was, it was a really interesting time to be reading this while people were, you know, out in the streets every day and seeing the kind of continuing struggle sometimes it's the same almost the same exact law or same um desire to just you know have a bit of peace in in the home and like ability to have uh, autonomy over your own space um and i think one thing hartman doesn't really do so much in the book is draw those parallels um she kind of leaves it to the reader to be able to to read them and it's like you could almost jump into any point in american history and you'll see we don't i i didn't often think about this period you know we we think about like 
the Great Migration and Reconstruction and the Civil Rights Era, but <laughs> there's kind of, a, at least in the popular thinking about civil rights history, I think this period in particular tends to be looked over quite a bit, the kind of first generation of, of urban uh, people coming who, you know, came up from the South or moved into cities for the first time. Um, but the parallels there are. Yeah, and it was a very uh, tragic period uh, in, in, in a American history after World War I and uh, some of the greater rights like 1919. And so that impact uh, on, on, on people, uh, and even as we move into the Harlem Renaissance period where you had a a period of renewal among these some of these same you know black folk and especially black women you know even here is you know the research even on the renaissance period is mostly on hughes and others uh and once once in a while uh zara but i think this this book is very important and i thank both of you uh for your contributions because it it takes up one step further and as a you know, the, the whole issue of who brings it forth, um, this is messy conversation. So we're just very pleased that it happened to be both of you. Couldn't have been better. And Clarence is, of course, at the forefront. And uh, per perhaps we can revisit this whole period again. There are lots of uh, comments, positive comments about today's thanking the speakers, thanking the organizing the topic, um, um, appreciation for each one of the presenters. Um, and uh, and this recommendation for you, Elaine, to use the book in uh, Beyond the Harlem Renaissance, like uh, keep rolling with it, find the implications of the book. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's a suggestion from Jacqueline. Uh -huh. Yeah, oh, there, there are definitely, definitely connections because this uh, different era and it's the non-expected mm -hmm. and the uniqueness of, uh, once again, with Black women, yeah, definitely. So thank you, Peeps, and, and Christine, thank you for your comments, your appreciation. Jennifer left, but thank you as well, Christine and Nakashima. No. So we're so glad to have Janica, one of our. And Janica is here. And her, her book is coming uh -huh. out. And Janica t told me earlier that this is one of her favorite books. So I'm so it happy. It is. You. And we just had a discussion on ra uh, ratchet womanism um, in, uh, on, on campus. And I was talking about um, this book as a like genealogy of, of, of ratchet womanism and ratchet womanism and migration. So I'm so sorry I missed this conversation, but I know it was wonderful. We we're glad to have you here all the same. Mm -hmm. And Lily, thank you for your comment as well. I, I, I want to underscore some of what Asa was saying earlier, just, you know, that especially tied to this idea of the chorus, which is how I was trying to end our discussion today and how the chorus continues. It continues to echo and move across time and, 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 and thousands of miles away in completely different contexts. Um, it's a, just such a powerful uh, image for me to to begin to think about the chorus in that way mm -hmm. i cannot i cannot remember the the title of the book but it's um I, uh, muhammad um he was the former uh, chairperson of the um, Stromberg uh, Institute, Harlem in, in New York, and he has this book about the criminalization of, of Black people historically, and 
I thought of that in reading this book and how, um, especially that image, these uh, criminal records and how they are constantly deeming and try, attempting to control and um, posture themselves with, uh, with Black people. And with Clarence, and I think Jacqueline both were talking about uh, vacancy laws, even the uh, system, the leasing of Black men and women, the leasing laws, all of these things part of the Black codes, which played a role in how, in this case, these particular women stepped out of that and refused to, to deal with it and be who they were. Yeah, great conversation. What I, what I saw in that picture that Asa put up again was the, that word counsel and mm -hmm. how that word was, uh, you know, labeled as like, if it was her attorney, that was a person who is still a person. It doesn't actually counsel you. They tell you, here's the law and here's what's going to happen. And they don't really tell you most of it or all of it but they tell you what your position is and they tell you you're, they're going to manage it for you. And the connection between that word and what we call counselors and what we call therapists and as a therapy school, like this history is so embedded in so many of our programs. And, uh, and mm -hmm. I think that confusion of the supremacy and the, and the naming of a role that is not actually supportive, but is uh, a negotiation with law, with these pieces of um, history that are still in the room all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I get that. Thank you, Sarah. And that makes me think too then about like late mid 20th century and how the psychological gaze fell upon Black women uh over and over and over again as the 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 problem as the source of racism as the the you know just every single time it's remarkable um and we're sort of seeing the foreshadowing of that in some ways and what's happening to these young black women uh in the earlier part of the 20th century It reminds me of some of the discussion, discussions we've been having in class around the language of academia and um, especially in the field of psychology, which is my uh, teaching area is, uh, you know, learning the words that we're even using in class and how do we, how do we situate those in, in, the, in this historical uh, study? I think it often, um, it often is left out and it's too important to do that with. Yeah, I, I mean, that's something that really struck me when first reading this was like the way, I mean, she really addresses like the carceral state police and sociologists, the reformers, like the, that kind of, the people coming in to study basically parallel like that, you know, they're, two sides of the same project. Um, and, you know, I know she's written quite a bit on uh, Du Bois and is like a great admirer of his, but really doesn't pull punches um, and, you know, kind of um, really looks at that era of scholarship and what was happening as, as like a, a part of that oppressive force that really kind of uh, tried to put a damper on, uh, you know, free living. Thank you, Asa. I, I, I wanted to add, uh, I don't want to keep uh, like a monopolizing or anything, but, but I wanted to add something here. There is a paradox of, of, of what you just said, of, of this incursion of the reformers and the scholars, stuff like that. But the paradox is this, uh, and, I'm, and I'm coming from the perspective of ethnography. 
and, 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 and the ethical elements that require that approaching the other with an ethical framework, right? In order to make it all the way to, to be able to talk about in these terms that I just did, like ethical framework, in order to get there, you had to first have the reformers that are the first ones that started to pay attention to there's something there going on. And then the scholars would come and the journalists would come and like, there's something. Here. And then even though there's, is, is, there's a dark layer that comes with that kind of attention, at the same time, attention gave way to a process of looking at this from different perspectives instead of keeping it under the carpet. You see what I mean? Is that that's the paradox, the terrible paradox of academia that <laughs> that academia is is, is 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 systematizing knowledge, is putting things in boxes, or is it has all this element of scrutinization and elitism, but at the same time is what what gives some liberating tools as well at the same time. So and <laughs> that's what I what I what I love to live in this world where we live and I being in spaces like the one we are right now. Yeah. So I just want to put that out there. I think I think that paradox it links nicely with kind of what, what I was saying earlier about like the violence of the archive where there's kind of two forms one of um, like the violence of the documentation itself mug shots you know measuring bodies and all of that and then on the flip side the violence of erasure of kind of um, ignoring a history or not documenting uh, people at, at because they're not important enough. So um, the, yeah, the kind of paradox, the dual forms of violence there. It's a they know how important it can be. That's, that's done by personally. But it, it's such a such a conundrum and such a fundamental issue, uh, and 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 I wonder if part part of the problem in in trying to work our way through that is too often it's contained in the methodologies of the archive, um, when when actually it's all happening in a larger container. Um, and without that context, right, without all those other voices and perspectives, then you do end up with these paradoxes of, well, we, we, we don't want to be read, right? We, we don't want to be legible. Uh, but wait, wait, we, 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 we want to be legible because there's benefits that come from that um, as well. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a mess. Just want to point out that ja Jacqueline's making a lot of work for Elaine. <laughs> she always does. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to say also, uh, Janica's uh, book is that line of uh, along that that uh, journey that we're looking at. You know, black women, and I I know your book is soon to be published. April, yes, and and actually Hartman informed um, some of the work thinking about you know the the violence to you know black girls' bodies in terms of you know discipline, and we talked about that a little last time. And I'm also thinking about uh, Hartman's "Lose Your Mother" um, as it's like, what about the stories that um, are lost, erased from the archive, um, and you know never get to be told, and so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these methods, and I love this conversation, um, you know, really help us think about where that violence comes from uh, to, you know, Black girls' bodies. Jenica, please uh, place that pre-order link in the chat. Oh, I did. Okay. <laughs> I said, forgive me for, for, for self-promotion, but. Okay, I didn't, um, I saw that first line, but I didn't see that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I have to have Thank you, you. In the, back in the summer, I guess. Is summer good? Summer's great. <laughs> I'm glad to, to talk about it. But it's, we're confirming um, it right now. 
is it yeah. light and legacies <laughs> like girlhood and stories of liberation but this idea of like where and y'all were talking about this um, idea of freedom like where the freedom comes from when you know the stories aren't don't free themselves right so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, what has to be broken open in order to to hear the voices of black girls and also black women mm -hmm. yeah they the struggle they the win i just want to reach out to those who haven't uh, spoken up and just make sure there's space for anything that you all want to bring into the conversation If nothing else, I, I I hope you buy the book. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And and they still have uh, through the end of the month to get the, the discount. Through the end of the month. Yeah. Yes, through the end of Black History Month to, to, to get the discount. So well worth it. Yeah, Malik's Bookstore, Los Angeles. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, it was weird, Jason, not not having you filling the chat with all kinds of <laughs> this time. Uh, yeah, I took a break for this week. But Jacqueline was putting some good links in there. Yeah. Thank you, Jacqueline. Well, if there's nothing else, should we wrap this up um be sure and come back next week for uh black love day and the six words project uh that's going to be great it'll be rosa and asa leading us through that interactive work um, have a bunch of messy conversations <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Stay messy, stay.